In this video, we will take a look at how strokes are diagnosed and then how strokes are treated and managed. The diagnosis of a stroke is clinical and with imaging techniques being used to aid in that diagnosis. A big part of stroke diagnosis and management is the early recognition and tools such as FAST and ROSIA are used. FAST involves facial drooping, arm weakness and speech disturbances while T is for the time, indicating the need for timely action. The ROSIA score, which stands for recognition of stroke in the emergency room, is similar and involves looking for any loss of consciousness or seizure activity, which counts against a stroke diagnosis, as well as facial, arm or leg weakness, speech disturbances or visual disturbances. A physical exam should also be done, which will cover the NIHSS score including levels of consciousness, motor function, sensory function, language and attention. Generally, suspected stroke patients will undergo a CT of the head without contrast, as coagulated blood will appear hyperdense on these scans. However, ischemia may not be seen in the early stages. Therefore, a CT scan is done more commonly to rule out bleeding. Further investigations may involve an MRI of the head, which is more sensitive for chronic hemorrhages, and areas of ischemia usually appear hyperintense on diffusion-weighted imaging. A Doppler ultrasound of the carotids may be done, and if the stroke was suspected to be caused by an aneurysm, an angiogram may also be done, as well as lab investigations including lipids and coagulation screens. You may have heard the expression, time is brain. In the early stages of ischemic stroke, the aim is to restore cerebral blood flow as fast as possible, as this results in fewer brain cells dying. According to the NICE guidelines, patients with non-disabling stroke, or TIA, should have early carotid imaging and urgent endarterectomy, as well as stenting if they have carotid stenosis. In patients who have an acute ischemic stroke, 150 to 300 milligrams of aspirin should be given orally or rectally if the patient is dysphagic. This 150 to 300 milligram dose should be continued for two weeks following the stroke until long-term antithrombotic treatment has been prescribed. In patients with an allergy to aspirin, clopidogrel may be used and a proton pump inhibitor should be added in patients with a history of dyspepsia. In cases of venous sinus thrombosis, anticoagulation should be started with an INR range of 2 to 3. Mechanical thrombectomy via an endovascular procedure is another option, especially for a large artery occlusion. This does not improve survival, but does improve the probability of living with a disability. Thrombolysis with agents such as recombinant tissue plasminogen activator or alteplase may be done. However, after approximately 4 hours, thrombolysis has been shown to worsen outcomes. Contraindications to thrombolysis include an unknown time of onset, high blood pressure, abnormal coagulation and recent surgery, among others. Statins are not routinely started in individuals following an acute stroke, but patients should continue them if they were already on them and should be considered to start them if lipid levels are above 3.5 millimoles per litre or 135 milligrams per deciliter of total cholesterol. In patients with a hemorrhagic stroke, the approach is primarily supportive. Anticoagulants and antithrombotics are generally stopped and in some instances, such as intracerebral bleeds with an initial presentation of hypertension, blood pressure may be reduced to approximately 140 systolic using nicardipine or labetalol. Surgery may also be performed to remove hematomas, and often, in the case of subarachnoid hemorrhage, endovascular therapies are used to treat other cerebral aneurysms. Several parameters need to be monitored in post-stroke patients. Supplemental oxygen may be given to patients that are hypoxic, but it is generally only needed if the saturations are lower than 95%. Glucose control is aimed at between 4 and 11 millimoles per litre, or 72 to 198 milligrams per deciliter. Often, levels are increased following a stroke 
and are associated with a worsened outcome. Although a recent study has shown that intensive glucose lowering therapy is not beneficial. Blood pressure manipulation is only recommended in individuals with hypertensive emergencies, eclampsia, or an intracerebral hemorrhage with systolic blood pressure above 200. Temperature is another parameter that needs close monitoring, as stroke patients who develop an increased temperature are more likely to die within the first 10 days compared to those that do not. This is independent of the source, A stroke patients may have a fever due to infection or hypothermia due to damage to the thermal regulatory centres. Antipyrexial agents are recommended against fever. Next, we have hydration and nutrition, which both need to be considered, which involves a swallowing function test before being given any oral fluids or medication. In those who fail the assessment, then an enteric feeding tube can be placed. Another crucial point in stroke management is rehabilitation, as 65% of stroke survivors leave hospital with a disability. Early mobilisation is beneficial to the overall outcome, and studies have shown that most of the regain in function is made in the early stages and first six months. Physical therapy and occupational therapy, involving an evaluation of the home of the patient, may also be done, as well as speech and language therapy if they were affected in the stroke. As part of this, the Barthel Index can be used to assess the dependency of a patient to estimate their required level of support. Following the acute phase, the focus turns to preventing any further strokes, and this is also relevant to anyone who is yet to suffer a stroke. Risk factors include hypertension, which accounts for up to 50% of the stroke risk. Reducing the blood pressure by 10 systolic or 5 diastolic can produce a reduction of 40% in the stroke risk. The lowering of blood pressure reduces the risk of both ischemic and hemorrhagic stroke. Hyperlipidemia is another risk factor. Therefore, the use of statins is recommended and a Mediterranean diet has been shown to reduce the risk of having a stroke. Diabetes is yet another risk factor. However, lowering glucose levels is not as effective in reducing large vessel complications like stroke as it is for small vessel complications like nephropathy or retinopathy. Antiplatelet medication like aspirin or clopidogrel are preferred and these have been shown to be highly effective in secondary prevention following a stroke or TIA. Next, we have anticoagulation drugs that are sometimes used in patients with atrial fibrillation or venous sinus thrombosis, but otherwise they are avoided due to the risk of bleeding. 